Steering geometry is one of the most important factors on bikes that is often overlooked and very often misunderstood. It's usually not something you pay attention to until you're shopping for a new fork and you realize that there are two offset options you have to choose from. If you just want the short version, shorter offset means more stable, longer offset means more agile. But if you want to learn why that is, then stick around. Fork offset was a good way to start this video because outside of the custom world, that's typically the only choice you have when you're setting up the bike the way that you want it. But let's take a step back and go over all the pieces and the parts and terminology before we go further into that. So this is a bike, or at least the business end of mine. So let's see if we can draw this out and make some sense of what's going on here. So the first thing that I want to do is draw a line right down what is known as the steering axis. So this is the axis that their steering actually rotates around. Not necessarily the axle, not necessarily our fork, but check out the head tube and of course the steer tube in there. It's where it actually pivots around in the headset. So I'm also going to draw another line here on the ground for reference. Let me make it a little better here. All right, that'll work. So here's our ground. <laughs> now notice right here where the tire actually touches the ground is what we call the contact patch. And also notice this contact patch where it touches the ground is behind the steering axis. This is one of the main factors that creates stability in our bikes. It's typically referred to as caster effect. Just like the casters on an office chair or the front of a shopping cart, the contact patch naturally trails behind the steering axis, which creates a self-centering effect or, you know, stability. And we describe the amount of stability or caster effect as the trail measurement. This measurement is the distance between the contact patch and the steering axis. Now, you will see it drawn sometimes along the ground here like this, this linear measurement, but this is not very useful to us. Measuring the trail distance across the ground does not account for the head angle of the bike. So bikes with different head angles cannot be compared fairly with this measurement. So instead, we measure it perpendicular to the steering axis. This way, the leverage that we are actually describing with this measurement is the same regardless of head angle. This is known as mechanical trail or normal trail. It's the one that we need to use so we're all speaking the same language and we can actually make informed decisions. Now, what about offset? So, coming back to earlier, when I said the steering axis is not necessarily through the axle, the measurement between the axle and the steering axis is our offset. It's simple as that. But why is that there? So, to put it simply, too much trail is a bad thing. Every time you turn your handlebars, you actually have to fight against the stabilizing force that's created by the caster effect. And the faster you go, the higher this force becomes. So we move the axle out in front of the steering axis, which shortens up our trail here. That's trade-off. So just remember, short offset means stability, long offset means agility. And you can think about it by remembering this picture here. If you make our offset longer, it takes away from our trail because they're parallel to each other. Now there's one other factor that comes up with all of this, and it's known as flop. If you're ever trying to stand your bike up for an Instagram picture and the front wheel keeps flopping over, then you know what this is. And so trail was the easy part, but this is where it gets weird. <laughs> so hang on and hold my beer. I'm going to try to break this down. Let's go back to just regular caster for a second. They essentially have a head angle of 90, you know, straight up and down, and just varying amounts of offset. And this makes things easy. Flop as we describe it does not exist in that system. 
but our modern mountain bikes have silly head tube angles and that introduces some other dynamics into the system we have to be aware of. So think about it this way. When we steer our bikes, the front wheel does not necessarily rotate directly around the steering axis. It actually pivots between the head tube of our bike and the contact patch because these are the points that it's actually touching during use and we're actually interacting with it. And remember, our steering axis is in front of the contact patch. So it's actually, it's not a perfect rotation. It's actually traveling around in an arc. This is the side effect of the stability that we need. So check this out. If we draw another imaginary line here, you can essentially think of it as it's rotating around that line describing that arc. And also notice how much wheel is above this line rather than below it. And so we have the weight of our wheel and tire suspended here in an unstable way and the universe doesn't like this so gravity wants to pull it back down to one side or the other. And the slacker our head angle gets, the greater this effect becomes. And so by going to you know silly head tube angles or even sometimes just pedaling up steep hill, we're effectively giving gravity better leverage to pull the wheel over off center. So the measurement that we use to describe flop is called the flop height. If we take the line that we use to measure the mechanical trail, the vertical distance between the end of it at the steering axis and the ground is our measurement, this guy right here. So if you think about it, if we bring our head angle all the way up to 90, this distance goes to zero. Or if we increase our offset far enough to bring the wheel back down all the way to zero, again, there's no more flop. And then that imaginary line that we drew just a minute ago ends up splitting the tire right down the middle. So there's no more flop. Now flop is typically overlooked because once we get enough speed, the caster effect from our mechanical trail starts to overcome this force by itself and it no longer requires us to add any force to the handlebars. Think about riding your bike with no hands. The faster you go, the easier it is. So in other words, doing, during the real riding, we'll call it, flop is not really a factor. But once it gets too high, it can become a problem. Just like this bike that I'm showing you right here. It's not only annoying in the parking lot, but this bike also tends to wander during slow speed riding, like climbing really steep fire roads, for example. It requires a lot of input you know, at the handlebars, just fine tuning all the time to keep it in a straight line. Now this is where it gets really weird, because the flop force that you're actually feeling at the handlebars is dependent on the weight of your wheel and tire to actually create that effect. So essentially, heavier setups will tend to be floppier than super lightweight wheels. Even if the flop height measurement is the same, the weight's gonna change it. And it even depends on the tire tread to some extent. So this part is mostly anecdotal, but I think there is some merit to it and it should be considered. I currently have a Maxxis Minion DHF on the front of this bike. And one of the first things I noticed when I rode it is that on really hard surfaces like asphalt, when you steer, it will tend to kind of flop over and then almost like, feels like it kind of gets stuck before it wants to go any further. And I believe that is because of this big gap in the treads here. And, you know, cause after all, it's not a perfect circle. So there's kind of like a, almost like a flat spot that it gets stuck on as you go around. So we should take flop height as more of an informative measurement. It requires more than just itself to be useful to us. But with all things equal, it is useful to keep in mind. For example, if all we can do is change our fork offset to get more or less trail, then the flop is going to change with it also. So basically, more trail means more flop, and less trail means less flop. Alright, so how can we actually measure these things in the real world? It's actually really simple. And I even made a cute little spreadsheet calculator I'm going to share with you in the description. Go check it out. It's handy to be able to compare these measurements side by side. But all you have to know are the three variables that change these things. You just need to know the head angle of your bike, your wheel radius, 
and then the fork offset. Beyond that, it's just basic trigonometry that you probably forgot since high school. And to get your wheel radius measurement, or diameter, and then just divide it by two, actually get a tape measure and measure it. <laughs> because here's a hint, a 29 inch wheel, or 27 and a half inch wheel, does not mean that it is 29 or 27 and a half inches in diameter. Different tire and rim setups will change the actual diameter significantly. So basically just take your tape measure and measure from, oh come on, measure from the top of the tire to the ground. That's the easiest way to do it. So here's the cute little spreadsheet that I made. And again, this will be down in the description so you can grab a copy of it and do whatever you like with. But basically, you just plug in your numbers, your head angle, wheel diameter, fork offset, and then it'll spit out your trail and flop for you. And I put two different columns here, that way you can compare two side by side and see what's what. Or if you want, you know, you can just copy and paste as, you know, as many as you want. <laughs> you know, have fun with it. But we can start to play around and see what does what. So, in short, we can increase our trail measurement by doing any of these things. We can increase the wheel diameter, we can decrease the offset, or we can slacken the head tube angle. And of course, the inverse of those for decreasing the trail measurement. And like I mentioned earlier, more trail means more flop. If you can only change your fork offset, that remains true. But for the custom world, we can really start to tweak in and dial in the design. For example, if we tweak the head angle in addition to the offset, we can start to get higher trail values and lower flop values. It's cool stuff. And this whole video started out because on my next bike, I'm going to have to end up making a custom fork for it. And so I have to make all these choices in the design. As in, you know, I have more than just two, to, two offset choices to play with. And, you know, it's also relevant because this bike, it's you know, the flop has become a problem. So it'll be fun to really tweak it and dial it in and be able to play with that. I think that pretty much covers it for today's video. Hopefully that will shed some light and maybe make things clear for you on just how one aspect of our bike works and give you a better understanding of the nerdy stuff that's going on behind the scenes, so to speak. Hey, quiz time. Did anyone notice where I talked about stem length in this video? Nope. That's right, because stem length is not a factor in how our bike handles or steers. It is, however, a factor in how you handle your bike. But more on that later. Thanks for watching.